Hello and welcome to Big Deal. I'm Nisha Podar. Now on the Deal Street, it may be a season of slowdown as capital becomes expensive and markets volatile. But there is an area of future businesses which continues to see interest coming in from focused funds. Now we are talking about the global thrust towards climate consciousness and the investment scenario in that particular space. And it's intact so far with an added impetus through global efforts like the recent and COP27 summit. Let's find out more from our uh, panelists today. Joining me on the show are Anjali Bansal, the founding partner at Havana Capital uh, Climate Fund, and also John Kretz, uh, who's the CEO of RMI. Welcome to CNBC TV 18. John, starting with you, what has been the biggest highlight from the COP27 summit, which will lift the focus on energy transition across the globe? Yeah, thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here, Nisha. I think the, the big stories at COP have, have to do a lot with finance, right? As we think about uh, both how exactly the global south in particular is compensated around loss and damage relative to some of the severe uh, uh, impacts that they're seeing on overall climate devastation here from floods and heat waves through to, to you know, kind of overall crop failures and other issues. That's been front and center, but there's also been signs of, of forward motion and progress in unsticking some of the capital flows from, from north to south uh, and from, from south to south, especially in Indonesia, which with their recent announcement at the G20, with a, a blended finance vehicle helping them make the transition faster. So these are some of the exciting things that are certainly uh, uh, happening right now on the investment front. Of course, there is uh, ongoing discussion here about the future of oil and gas. Last year, there was a discussion around coal, uh, and there was an agreement that unmitigated coal should be phased out. And now the discussion on oil and gas was poised to do the same, but as of this morning, kind of drew back from that. And it looks like there won't be a, an announcement on that front. Um, there is, though, very much uh, ongoing support for natural capital and thinking about how exactly we value better the Earth's resources, and there was almost a rock star reception yesterday for Lula as he came in, uh, you know, kind of bearing uh, the, the banner and the flag to support the Amazon and the preservation of natural capital here going forward. That's right. And uh, John, also RMI, the organization that you represent, has been working very actively towards reducing the greenhouse gas emission across the world. Now, uh, Anjali, before I start talking about the investment destinations and the thesis and the sharpened focus that Avana Capital has towards uh, the climate consciousness and areas of interest there, my one question is, while the economy is looking difficult, we are talking of recessionary phase also going forward, and when it's a matter of survival for most of the companies, do you think that uh, the climate consciousness, the investment towards energy transition and going towards more sustainable forms of energy is taking a back seat or there could be a lower liquidity flow? So, Nisha, first of all, it's uh, great to be back with you on CNBC talking about climate and sustainability and with John here as well. Um, so I think climate and sustainability is now definitely the next big global imperative. It's where we were with digitization and technology 25 years ago. Digitization has got embedded across the board in how we live, how we work, how enterprises work. And the same thing has to happen with climate action and sustainability. So it's, it's not just a planetary imperative, it's also a business imperative. So while yes, we will go through our ups and downs on the economy, we will have um, global sort of geopolitical issues, uh, the investment behind climate and sustainability and particularly climate action, whether it is energy transition, energy security, food security, I think the focus on that is sharper than ever, both in the political discourse, policy discourse, as well as the economic discourse. All right. So it, it really sustains and uh, the people are working towards it. Many companies have given uh, their road and path to, profit, uh, to sustainability in the coming years as well. So that goes on. But John, looking at the global picture and where India stands, and you have spent a lot of time on India-focused uh, you know, projects as well for energy transition. Where does India stand at this point and how is it growing? Give us an insight into that. Yeah, so in order for us to really make this transition and to create climate alignment, we're going to need 
to spend three to five trillion a year, this year and every year for the next 30 years, right? And India is uniquely poised right now to actually profit from and lead the world globally in this transition. It has some of the best solar resources in the world. It is developing uh, incredibly quickly at a moment where it doesn't need to retrofit existing uh, capital, but actually can build right from the start. And in the process, actually pioneer some of our technologies around things like green hydrogen and how you use your amazing solar resources ultimately to produce green molecules that can then be used for, for everything from steel and cement to ammonia uh, to support global industries like shipping and fertilizer. Um, this is a, a tremendous opportunity for India overall, but it's not just around hydrogen, it's also around areas like mobility, where we've seen uh, working alongside Niti Ayog the opportunity to to rapidly electrify, uh, uh, you know, kind of the overall uh, mobility fleet within India, especially starting with urban delivery vehicles and uh, TNCs or, or taxi and livery vehicles, right? And by starting early with, with two wheelers and three wheelers in, in urban environments, you not only get the benefits of cli climate reduction, but you also get the benefits of air pollution reduction and quieter cities. Uh, and all of this infrastructure as it's built up provides India the opportunity to not just clean the air in its cities, but also to build out battery supply chains and play into the overall industrial base. So it's a very exciting time for India to step forward and lead on many of these new green technologies that need to be taken to scale, not just to meet India's internal needs, but become a major then export market for India to participate in here going forward. All right, export market as well. And I'll come to uh, other legs of being the export market for the world when it comes to the clean, clean and green technology. But Anjali, John was mentioning about the clean mobility aspect. You've been an investor and you have a keen eye on what is going to make money. How do, how do you see the potential of electric vehicles while our infrastructure, battery and charging facilities are still only at a nascent stage? So Nisha, this is how investors see things. Anything that is at a nascent stage is an opportunity, right? Somebody will build it out. And we are investing in the companies that are creating the technology. They're creating the stacks as well as mobility. So I'm going to take a step back for a minute. And John mentioned this from uh, his vantage point at COP. Uh, what I've been seeing and what we've been seeing globally, whether it is in the US and the discourses in the Middle East and here now in Singapore, uh, India is integral to global climate solutions. We are a large economy, fastest growing, one of the fastest growing economies, large and young population, and we absolutely aspire to continue growing over the next two decades. Much of our infrastructure is yet to be built. Much of our mobility is yet to be built. So we do have the opportunity to do it right and follow a much greener development model, much like the Honorable Prime Minister and Niti Aayog also has put out, which, which is the Panchamrit model and more recently the Panch Pran, which is around sustainable and inclusive development. Mobility, energy transition, energy access, carbon, and food security are integral parts of this. So at Havana, we look at all three, right? So we look at energy transition, mobility and supply chain, and food security as our investment pillars, specifically around mobility, as you mentioned. Um, I think John was absolutely right, agree with him, that uh, solving for intra-city movement of goods and services is a critical component, one of taking pollution away from urban centers, but also uh, supporting and facilitating. We have a national EV mission which says a 50% fleet on streets uh, to be EV. Hmm. Uh, charging infrastructure will get built. Some of it yeah. will be large scale capex. Uh, green hydrogen will happen. And I think we have some leading Indian companies who are investing both science dollars as well as commercial dollars and rupees into green hydrogen. Yes. And similarly, when we have a company called Turno, Turno is actually enabling at scale the a large scale adoption of electric vehicles by small commercial vehicle operators. So this is your one ton, two ton CV, yes. which is the backbone of all intracity deliveries and intracity trade. Right. So once that goes, then similarly, I can keep going. We have a number of companies that we are seeing. We see 200 companies every quarter so that Anjali, are enabling transition. So Anjali, you mentioned, let's focus on mobility bit uh, for, because you have a fair bit of investments there. And you mentioned that at a nascent stage, we invest so that we see the potential to grow. 
But when we are talking about innovation and technology, there is also a risk of technological changes and evolution. How do you balance that out? Give us an insight from an investor. So from a Avana point of view, we invest in market ready, commercializable business models. So where a lot of the technology risk is already taken care of at the lab stage. But that said, going beyond Avana, what we need is across the ecosystem. And frankly, we are seeing this. We are seeing a lot of R&D capital going in, whether it is in battery technology or it is in food technology, um, and in including battery recycling. And we know that uh, we do have a particular dependence on lithium. Uh, there are geopolitical realities. There are supply chain interruptions as well. So it's not just technology risk, Nisha, but also in some ways supply chain risks that need to get mitigated. Um, so there is lab stage R&D capital that needs to go in. There is, of course, folks like us who are early stage, who we come in and help companies commercialize the technologies and scale up. And then eventually it leads to much larger uh, scale build out of, of infrastructure. And we have seen this in the solar space, for example. Right. In right. So solar, we now have utility scale solar that is no longer a sort of venture stage, but really large capital going in. And it has been mentioned earlier, India in particular is a great market for solar energy. And we are starting to see the transition at, at scale transition to 50% renewable across the country. That's right, Anjali, well pointed out because the government has also put a lot of thrust towards solar, solar energy and some of the big houses with deep pockets have been working towards uh, reaching that aim by the government as well when it comes to the renewable sources of energy. But we'll slip into a short breather on the show at this point and we'll come back and discuss much more about the investments and funding in the sectors of the future which are clean and green technology. Stay tuned to Big Tech.